uh, every. Ooh. Uh, we're recording tonight's uh, presentation. So every year we look forward to our Kaplan Scholar in Residence made possible by very generous gifts from Dee and Arnie Kaplan and also the Peck family. And uh, it is such a treat for us to be, um, have an opportunity to learn from some of the great minds uh, and curious thinkers, authors, rabbis, scholars, professors that come to Sarasota, come to our temple each year, whether it be in person or virtual. This year, we have new chairs in the committee after many years uh, being led by uh, the, the Barnetts, by, uh, uh, and before that by uh, Eunice Cohen, and, and, before, and uh, well, many pre pre predecessors. We are thrilled to announce that this year we have new chairs, and they've been working very hard this past year. They are Ellen Klein and Wendy Wicks. And we have asked them to step up here to introduce uh, our scholar. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Now, indulge me just for a moment. I do wanna thank a wonderful committee. Uh, we spent a lot of time, mostly on Zooms and emails, putting something together. Um, it wasn't the easiest way to put together a scholar in residence weekend, but uh, we did it. So I wanna thank a rather large committee, but everybody played a role in not only uh, choosing a scholar, but also the topics that will be presented this weekend. So I wanna thank Arn Kaplan, Philip Meltzer, Rabbi Elaine Rose Glickman, Toby Halpern, Esther Rose, Ellen Zippen, Janet Hiller, Ike Cozio, Cindy and Dan Abinoff, Adrian Hutt, and of course, Ellen, my co-chair. Um, we've had a wonderful, wonderful time putting this together. Um, and I've had, I've had the pleasure actually of having some conversations with Rabbi Kadar, which was a real pleasure. That was my piece of the little, little job. Um, so I wanna introduce Rabbi Kadar now um, and start by saying one of the things that this committee really wanted was because this is the 50th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman rabbi the reform in the reform movement, the committee really said, we really want to find a wonderful woman rabbi, a scholar for our weekend, and darned if we didn't do it. <laughs> so Rabbi Karen Kadar is an acclaimed teacher of mindfulness practice. Who is, she has contributed to many, many writings in prayer books, periodicals, anthologies, and is the author of five books, including Amen, right here, The Bridge to Forgiveness, is another book. And she serves as the senior rabbi at, at BJBE, B'nai Jehoshua Beth Elohim in Deerfield, Illinois. And just a PS about this book, we arranged for Alice to have copies of it available in the gift shop. Okay, Rabbi Kadar, we're looking forward to hearing you speak now. Well, hello everybody. This has been a long time coming. I have to say that, um, First of all, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm sad not to be in person. Um, hopefully we will wander into your little corner of the world uh, soon enough. Um, but I already know um, about this community to be, and I'm just putting myself on gallery view so I can see your faces. Um, I know about this community to be professional and classy and intelligent. I have um, enjoyed every interaction that I have um, had with your congregation. You know, it, it, at this stage of, of the game, I get around a little bit and I'm being at, at many, many communities. And I have to say something that you all already know that your community is really stellar um, and uh, just a fa fabulous community. And I wanna thank the chairs, Wendy and Ellen, you worked very hard along with your committee and your rabbis who have been incredibly gracious. Um, some old friends that are around the table, the Meltzers, of course, who we wandered the halls of many, many conventions uh, throughout, the, throughout the world uh, together, um, trying to make change and, and do good things in the world. So it's good to see you, Philip and Barbara. I'm sorry we're not having dinner together. 
Um, and all the people that, um, that are here, I heard that your president is here. Presidencies to me are, um, are of the highest esteem. And I, I always appreciate the presidents and of course the, the donors of this particular program who um, bring in people from all over so that, uh, so that you can hear what's going on in the world and expand your mind with curiosity. Um, so we have a series of topics. Uh, I'll be speaking three times throughout this, this um, wonderful odyssey. And tonight I'm going to be speaking about um, the reframing and the telling of the story of your life. Um, I have to say that this is a very poignant time for me personally. Looking around the room, I'm sure that many of you are going to understand what I'm about to say. I enter into retirement on May 31st and about to go into my last 100 days as senior rabbi of BJBE. And, um, and just give me a thumbs up to tell me I'm going to love it, right? There you go. I knew you would be encouraging. And I expect to, <laughs> I expect to love um, every bit of it. Um, and we could go on and on and talk about what this process is, but the whole idea of telling the story of your life has, has accompanied me my whole life, um, but it has really uh, become profound in the last several days, uh, the last several months as I prepare for this next step um, in my life. I welcome um, comments in the chat. I welcome your hands being raised. We have some questions that we could be asking. Um, I plan to speak about, mm, Rabbi, what did we say? 20 to 30 minutes? Is that is that what you're thinking? Sounds great. Okay, about 20 to 30 minutes. It is 525, so we won't, uh, oh, uh, in Arizona anyway. Um, so we won't keep you um, too long and um, and let's just get straight into it. Many years ago, my eldest daughter, I, we have three children, whose name is Talia, said to me, Mom, it's my birthday. I'm going to turn 20. And I said to her, Talia, you listen to me very closely. The first 20 years, you grow up. The second 20 years, you heal from growing up. By the time you're 40, get over it because it's no longer attractive to be drooling in public. And she said, mom, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, I mean, happy birthday, dear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as I started to really think through what are the different stages one has um, in, in our development and on our growing up, I realized that we have truly five stages. And I'd love to hear your idea of this. First 20 years, we grow up. The year from birth to age 20, oh my God, we were such different people. We were growing, we were expanding, we were getting knocked down on the playground in third grade. We were running wild. We were trying to figure out who we are and what life was all about. Life was exuberant and careless and carefree and, and oh so very serious. And then the next 20 years from 20 to 40, well, really, those were the healing years. No matter what your story is, there was something that you had to do to heal from it, something that kind of nicked your soul in such a way, the, the dings, I say, of, of what life is in that initial growing up that we somehow had to heal. It's quite possible we had wonderful parents, lived in a great environment, really kind of grew up in a privileged life. And yet, life is a tough neighborhood. And whatever that first 20 years was, it took us 20 years to go ahead and start to sort it out, to start to find a little bit of perspective. The next 20 years, from 40 to 60, boy, were we ever busy children, career, trying to earn a living, trying to make a name for ourselves, trying to drive carpool, running from place to place to place to place. Life was so frenetic, so busy. Our reputation was at line. Everything seemed to matter. Everything was on a heightened point of view. We were running and running and running and barely had the chance to even breathe, 
to even take a, a chance to notice what was going on around us. And then something I think kicked in at about age 60. Now I say this next part with a little bit of humility because next in a couple of weeks, I turned 65. So I'm in the beginning part of this next 20 years. But it seems to me those years, if we are granted good health and we should all be granted good health and we are granted length of years, the years between 60 and 80 are our wisdom years, our legacy years. We kind of have a different footing. We kind of say to the world, you know what? It is what it is. Or as I like to say better than that, what is, is. And what is not, is not. And this is who I am. And this is who I will never be. And yes, I'm always a little annoying in this particular area. And okay, I have made it or not. And I kind of go into these years and start to wonder 60 through 80, what is going to be the legacy? What are they gonna say about me? What do people think about me? What is the mark that I wanna make in this world? As I go into myself with a great deal of comfort. The fourth, the fifth stage of life can actually happen in any of these 20 years of decades. It can happen in your first 20, second 20, third 20, or fourth 20. And that stage of life is when you are confronted with mortality, when you really, really understand that this isn't forever. Maybe you had a sudden loss. Maybe something shook your life. When you are confronted with mortality in a profound kind of way, it shifts the way that you see the world. And that is forever and gives you a different kind of perspective. So here we are, I wanna talk about maybe the fourth decade, the years between 60 and 80, and ask for your schooling, ask for you to teach me, because you're closer in those age, longer in that, in that period of time than I am. But it seems to me that right now, folks, we have three superpowers, three things that can really change the way that we see the world. One, we have the power to decide. Decision is a spiritual principle. Two, we have the power to shift our perspective, to see things a different way, a softer way, a kinder way. Three, we have the power to reframe the way that we tell the story of our lives, to tell it in terms of its blessings rather than its curses. So let's first talk about the period, the superpower of decide. And before I do, I'm looking around the Zoom room and wondering if you have any comments at this point, typing into the chat or maybe raising your hand. We're still waiting to defer judgment. How are we doing here? We good? Keep going. I was assured by Wendy that this was a chatty group. Okay, we will keep going. I am going to share screen. And here we go. Can you see? There we go. Let me put this over here. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. I saw your hand go up. So this is from the book that is in the, in the, in the bookshop, um, the book of Amen. And uh, it's also in my book of um, the counting of the Omer. And I cannot overstate how powerful it is to make a decision to be another way. We tend to go through this light kind of wandering here and there to and fro, almost as if we 
don't have any power. What comes to our head comes to our head. What happens, happens. We're kind of like a ship in a sea, but actually we have the power to decide to live a different way. And the twin sister to decision is the, is the powerful spiritual principle of choice. So let's look at this. Let's read this for a second. And I'll go ahead and read it for you. Today, I decide to turn my eyes towards wonder so that I may see the expanse before me. Today, I decide to see the possibility of my life so that I may open my mind to greatness. Today, I will do one kindness so that my heart may become more loving. Today, I will pause to consider so that my life may become more deliberate. Help me, dear God, to step firmly upon a path of consequence so that I may make my life a prayer of goodness and mercy, splendor and light. I ask for a life of meaning, a sense of purpose. Today, I decide. let you take a look at that and pause for just a second as you look to see what that looks like to you. And I wonder, as I keep the screen up and kind of make my vision of who you are a little bit bigger, I wonder which line resonates with any of you in this whole concept of the power of making a decision to see and to live a different way. Of the lines that I have written here, which one resonates with you? And I will ask our people to help me, since I can't see the whole screen, to unmute or go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like. Yes, I see you, Judith and Ike. Hi again. Yes, uh, reson uh, today I will do one kindness so that my heart may become more loving, which mm. is a wonderful loving kindness meditation or part of that. Uh, just just that openness uh, to uh, make one, aside from doing good for the world or someone else, you're doing good for yourself. Mm, I love that. Yes, it is part of the loving kindness meditation. And actually, that decision to be kind every day is a decision that can really transform one's life. I love that. Thank you very much for sharing that. Adrian, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. At the very end, I ask for a life of meaning, a sense of purpose. Today I decide. Mm. So there's, although I'm in the um, 60 to 80 stage, I, there's still more. There's still more. And with the years that I uh, I will have and go on. Um, I hope to make that, those years a life of meaning. Mm. Amen to your prayer there. I agree 100%. And I don't use this phrase meaning and purpose lightly. Uh, if we were all to write a mission statement about our lives, I would say that the mission statement of my life is to find avenues to sharpen the meaning and purpose of life. It's not just a cliche, meaning and purpose, meaning and purpose, but actually I kind of look at this and I wonder, Adrian, if you agree with me or some of the other people here might also agree that meaning I define as that internal conversation we have with ourselves when we kind of wake up in the middle of the night and we say, what, what is the meaning of my life? It's our conversation with the darkness. It's our conversation with the light. It's that conversation that we don't tend to have with a whole lot of people. Maybe we're gonna talk about sustainers as the days go on, but with the people that are our inner circle, what is the meaning of my life? Why am I here? And purpose I see as, which correlates to what Ike said, as the external conversation we have on our lives. In other words, that dialogue we have in the, with the world that gives my life purpose, that kindness that I extend, the time that I put my hand on the shoulder of another or 
offer a moment of gratitude or blessing. And so these two things, the internal monologue I have with myself, why am I here? And the external dialogue I have with the world, I am here to serve, how may I help you? Those two things are a decision. They're in that power of decision and they help deepen our very existence. Comments. I know I got deep very quickly. We Wendy, were, we were uh, I'd, uh, I'd like Wendy thank you. Again, the sense of purpose, those of us who are already retired, as you will be come shortly, um, the wonderful thing about retirement for many of us is that we've lived, we've had our careers, and we've done things that hopefully were meaningful in our lives. Now we get to choose differently. And so many of the group that's present now have chosen to do amazing volunteer work, get involved in programs, committees, committed to um, Tikkun Olam, to making the world a better place. And, and I just want to acknowledge that so many people here are really taking that sense of purpose to heart in retirement, taking it to another level. You know, Wendy, I'm so glad you brought that up for a, a brief, um, curious time. I lived in Boca Raton. Um, it's a very long story and I don't need to go, which I don't need to go into in this moment. But what I discovered when I was living in Boca is that a lot of the people who came, many of them in retirement, also retired from synagogue life. And I have a very keen sense that this evening of all evenings, that I am among my people, though we don't know each other. Mm. And why am I among my people? Because we understand somehow that you don't retire from a life of purpose. You don't retire from a life of meaning. You engage, you continue to expand your mind with curiosity. You continue to give generously of, of mind and of body and of spirit. You continue to engage in life, not on the surface, also on the surface, a little bit of bridge and canasta and tennis or whatever it is you do, but also to deep delve deeply into the greatness and the beauty of life. So absolutely, I'm so honored to be here this particular evening from a group of people who have not retired from a life of meaning and purpose. One more comment, and then I'm gonna take down um, this particular screen because it's hard to look at the screen. Sure. I, uh, oh, uh, Judith, Co Judith Koziel has her hand up. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, so mine is a little bit different. Today I will do one kindness for those of us who do so much and don't know how to slow down. The one kindness helps remind me that I can do one and do it meaningfully and get the benefit of it and give the benefit of it and that I don't have to do everything. Mm, absolutely. And, and to, to continue with that thought, the one that caught my eye, particularly as I'm teaching right now, is today I will pause to consider so that I may, that my life may become more deliberate, mm -hmm. right? To walk with a sense of purpose and deliberation. Should I take down the screen? We good? Okay, so here we, uh, we are understanding that one of the superpowers that we have is the power to decide, the power to choose a different way. Another superpower that we have is the power of, of perspective. I love this one because, um, because there is so much that we make up. I would even say, and sometimes I get challenged on this, but not often, that, I, that about 80% of our life, the 80% of what happens to us, we actually make up. There's a good 20% that's really happening, but the other 80%, we totally make up. I like to call it uh, the lady in the fourth row. What about the lady in the fourth row? So here I am speaking, call it Kol Nidre. Yom Kippur, 
And we have a couple thousand people in the room. And we, I am uh, uh, gratefully in a great, in a, in a, I'm serving a big synagogue. So we have a couple thousand people in the synagogue and I am speaking and I don't write my sermons down. So I actually can see all of you. I don't speak from a written text and I'm talking and I'm talking and all of a sudden the lady in the fourth row happens every time turns to her person next to her and goes, <laughs> and I have a choice about the way I am going to interpret that. So I think to myself, oh my God, what did I just say? Did I just say something stupid? Oh, she never really did like me. Oh my goodness. What did I just totally... Is my button unbuttoned? Why is she laughing at me? Or I could think she just whispered to her friend because her husband just kicked her and he said, oh, here we go again. He's kicking me. I wish he'd keep his feet to himself. Here I am looking at this lady in the fourth row and if I get distracted and assume that it's about me and not only assume it's about me, but assume that it's a negative thing about me, then the whole sermon is gone. But if I don't make that assumption, if I don't make the negative up, the negativity that comes to me that I have totally invented, then I can go on and I can continue to deliver the sermon. So much of what happens to us, we make up through our assumptions, through our life stories, through the way that we are brought up. Let me give you a great example. This example is one of abundance versus one of scarcity. So you're with a perhaps partner or a spouse and you're having people over for dinner back in the day. Now I'm assuming you eat out a lot and carry out and don't so much have dinner parties, but who remembers dinner parties? <laughs> I'm actually, one of my goals when I'm uh, retired is to bring back the art of the dinner party and you're all invited. So somebody says, okay, you know what? Uh, I just got a call last minute that so-and-so was bringing her cousin that just came in from Florida. And the spouse says, what? I don't have enough chicken. And the other spouse says, ah, you got plenty of chicken. And the other one says, no, really, there's no room at the table. I set the table exactly for 12 and now there's 13. How are we going to do this? And the other one says, you know what? There's always room for one more. Or take the example in my particular family. What? You needed to buy another pair of shoes? You have so many shoes. What do you mean I have so many shoes? There's always room for one more. This whole idea, and my husband just yelled at me from the other room. This whole idea of is there plenty or isn't there enough? This whole idea of abundance for scarcity is something that we come by very, very naturally. We can see the world as completely abundantly providing, or we can see the world as very scarce and not providing at all. And we learned it. And frankly, we often marry our opposite. Who feels that probably happened? We kind of parallel play and marry the one who is the opposite of us. But here's the thing. If you're going to make up your reality, because 80% we've made up, you might as well make it up to your advantage rather than disadvantage. Why not assume that the world is overflowing with goodness? You know, when we have kiddish, Sometimes under the Kiddush cup, there's a little plate. I don't know if you do that in your synagogue. What is the reason for that little plate? Because when we make Kiddush, we're supposed to fill the wine up to the very, very top. And that little plate underneath is for the overflow. To live a Jewish existence does not mean living the, the cup is half full or the cup is half empty but rather in this Jewish world, our cup is overflowing. Kos Revaya, our cup overflows. Surely 
goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not fear, not trepidation, not darkness, but goodness and mercy. And because our first superpower was the power of decision and choice, if you happen to have a scarcity mentality and you do not see the world as abundantly providing, you absolutely have the choice to shift and to change that perspective. It takes time. It is not easy. We have spent a lot of time making these tapes in our heads the way they are. But if we want to see the world overflowing with blessing, we totally, absolutely can. Because the myth that we grow up on as Jews is that the cup overflows. Superpower number one, the power to decide. Superpower number two, the power to have a perspective that is abundant. Superpower number three, are you ready? The ability, the power to reframe our life so that we can tell our story as one of heroes. I believe in heroic living. Has things happened to us? Absolutely. Do we all have a story to tell? No question. Have you been knocked down several times in your life? That's my guess. If you could, could you tell your story in terms of disappointments? Probably. Were there failures along the way? Absolutely. It's a life. And we know this because we're in the fourth 20 years of our existence. There are ups and downs and twists and turns and ins and outs. But what if we decide, spiritual principle number one, to see our lives abundantly, spiritual principle number two, and tell our story as one of heroism. Become the hero, the hero of your own life. I'm going to share screen for just a second. Share. And I'm going to offer this one to you. Only this. I ask of you, oh God, only this. Grant me a curious mind. An agitated conscience. An open and discerning heart a surrendering spirit, and then, and then, I shall become a servant of the holy good. Isn't that what we all want? That 120 years from now, as we stand and our loved ones tell the story of who we are, they say, you know what? Let, let me tell you this person, who they really were. They were a person who searched for the meaning and purpose in life. They were a person who was a servant of the holy good. It is not too late right now to start to tell the story of your life as one that you have gone through this life with a mind that expands in curiosity, whose conscience is agitated so that we don't stand for evil and injustice, whose heart heart is open and discerning. Please, God, grant me an open and discerning heart that all the crustiness gives away in this stage of my life. A surrendering spirit to all that is good and beautiful and abundant. And then, and then I shall become a holy servant of the holy good deciding to walk in paths of kindness, of righteousness, of goodness, choosing abundance, 
and heroic living, choosing to really bless the day for, oh my God, it is so filled with blessing. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kadar. Thank you, Arnie and Dee Kaplan, for this present to us. And this is just the beginning. Uh, tonight's presentation was our foretaste of uh, our upcoming uh, services and our main presentation on Saturday morning. 